Hello there. <clears throat> Thank you guys for choosing my tropical marine ecology and conservation um, module. I guess it's, it's difficult times trying to, to give these uh, lectures in a, in a virtual environment. Um, I hope you guys are all coming to terms with this and uh, making uh, the best of a, a, a tough uh, scenario. Over the, uh, the term, I'm going to be leading this module, Bio 330, which is a, um, a 10 credit module. And uh, I guess many of you who are <clears throat> also um, part of this, this module would have been hoping to have gone on a tropical marine uh, field course. Unfortunately, that's not happened. And uh, <clears throat> we'll be doing our best on this module to try and at least give you uh, the best flavour we possibly can of the, uh, um, the marine tropics. Good afternoon, my name is Dr Richard Unsworth. Um, I'd like to say thank you to you all for choosing uh, to take this module, Tropical Marine Ecology and Conservation, Bio 330, which is a, a 10 credit module. Over the, uh, the next um, term, I'm going to be giving you a series of lectures around this topic. And uh, I guess there's a whole group of you who'll be disappointed that you're not kind of putting some of the, um, the theory that you're learning in this into practice with a, a tropical marine field, um, a field course in January. Um, it's sad for us all. Um, and it's difficult times. It's very tough trying to even give this lecture series um, um, virtually, but we'll be doing our best to inspire you um, about the marine environment in another part of the, um, of the world. So to do this, we'll be giving these kind of these lectures, but also be trying to, to run some sessions where we can discuss some, um, some key concepts, possibly adding in some additional uh, interesting videos to supplement um, these uh, these lectures, doing our very, very best we can to create a module that's interesting, intellectually stimulating, and um, leaves you with a really strong uh, understanding of the, um, the functioning of um, tropical marine ecosystems. Over this term, there's going to be um, a number of different uh, lecturers involved with the teaching. Um, I obviously lead this module um, with a background in tropical marine ecology um, and conservation, very strong focus on seagrass ecosystems particularly. And I, I guess that I've also worked on, on coral reefs, uh, studying coral disease, um, studying some of the, uh, the fish communities that are, are present on coral reefs and also running for a number of years a, um, a coral reef monitoring program in eastern Indonesia. The group that um, supports me are also very strong in terms of their tropical um, marine experience. Nicole Esteban used to be a marine park manager in, uh, in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, she'll be giving you a, a flavour of her, some of her experiences working out there. Um, we're also um, fortunate to have some input from um, Miguel uh, Luigi, who's going to be giving you some uh, perspectives of sponge ecology. And then uh, Fraser Hanakowski Hartley, who's going to be giving you um, some lectures on his kind of detailed understanding of, of reef development and how that's impacted by the, the animals um, and the, uh, the status of the, the corals that, that uh, are living on those uh, reef systems. So a great team to teach this module. And uh, in these kind of difficult times with lots of virtual lectures, listening to my uh, dulcet tones time and time again might, uh, might not appeal, but maybe there's a, uh, a win by having a bit of variety from uh, Nicole, uh, Miguel and, and Fraser. In addition to those, uh, those lectures, we're also hoping to get some additional guest lectures in to, to supplement some of the, uh, the teaching that uh, we're providing. 
Um, I've had confirmation that Dr. David, uh, Professor, sorry, David Smith from uh, the University of Essex, my former PhD supervisor, um, he'll be giving a, a lecture on the um, physiology of coral bleaching. That'd be a, a very interesting thing because it's something that he's done a lot of uh, work on over, over many years. And uh, we're hoping to also bring in a, an expert um, who um, is a good friend of mine uh, to, to, to talk about coral reef restoration, but I'll, um, I need to confirm that, so I won't uh, finalize that for, for now. The key learning outcomes of this module are really to, to gain a, an understanding of the ecology and the biology of tropical marine ecosystems, uh, developing an understanding of the factors driving their diversity, driving their productivity, and develop a knowledge of their ecosystem service value and how anthropogenic processes um, at local, regional and global scales are, are actually degrading these systems and reducing their capacity to, to supply ecosystem services. Looking forward, it's, it's quite a tough topic to, to consider, um, particularly the, uh, the, the coral reef element. But there are things that we can we can do to proactively manage uh, tropical marine systems into the future. Uh, there is optimism out there, and we'll be trying to give you a flavour of how how we can actually make uh, uh, key actions to um, help point these systems towards a, a sustainable management um, um, scenario. The module will be focused around two kind of uh, key elements. Um, it was always going to be an exam, um, but uh, as a result of uh, some of the experiences running the, 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 the virtual online exams in the summer, we've now tweaked that um, and we think it's more appropriate to do a, a directed reading essay as actual coursework exercise rather than um, doing that in a, 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 a sort of an uh, an online exam environment, which is possibly not the uh, the best thing for um, uh, um, learning, really. Um, so by doing it as a coursework, you, you get feedback, you get uh, you learn something about how how you're you're beginning to critically assess these uh, systems. So a series of lectures, um, at least one uh, workshop. We might have some discussion sessions um, throughout the weeks as well to to talk about these. Uh, these online lectures that I'm, I'm giving, such as this one today. And then later on in the year, in the lead up to the uh, exams, we'll have a, a revision session. I really hope that that revision session is um, uh, less virtual and more face to face. And it's a chance to, um, to really chat through, through some of the uh, issues that come up in this, um, in this module. So the directed reading. Um, basically, we have a, a topic, the drivers of carbon storage in tropical mangrove forests. So this is the, uh, I guess, the, the environmental and the anthropogenic drivers that, that might result in more or less carbon um, or the biological uh, drivers that um, might result in more or less carbon being in a, a, a mangrove forest. And um, this is a, a very uh, hot current topic. We're thinking about nature based solutions to climate change. One of those is increasing our mangrove cover around the planet and with it sucking up lots of carbon from the atmosphere into stinky, muddy um, mangrove sediments. And um, the capacity to do that uh, involves understanding the, uh, the factors that are driving um, the uh, accumulation of carbon in those, those sediments. So uh, this is a really good um, um, topic. Um, and um, I encourage you at this point to just think of it as a topic and I will come back to with you with a, a more formal structure for how the, um, um, the assignment will actually uh, be constructed. So the, the first part of this lecture series is very much my, my sort of my baby. Uh, it's, uh, it's the wonderful world of seagrass meadows. Now, um, 
you might come across different terminology to, to refer to these, but they're all the same thing. Um, you get eelgrass beds that are mostly um, describe the, the meadows that exist in the, uh, the temperate north. Um, some people use the term SAV or submerged aquatic vegetation. And in, in many contexts that, that refers to places where you, you often get a, a mixture of freshwater and estuarine to marine environments causing a crossover between seagrasses and aquatic vegetation. So um, it's not strictly just seagrass, so it's that, that the mixed um, species assemblage of plants. So that's where, we're, um, where, where people use that, that terminology, often in the, uh, the coast of the, of the US. Um, seagrass beds are just another word for seagrass meadows, exactly the same thing. I'm going to scan over some of the very basic um, information on seagrass meadows. I gave some of that in a, uh, a level two module in uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, if you don't have that module, uh, that, that lecture, I can actually, I'll see if I've still got it as a, a PowerPoint and I'll put it up onto the, um, um, the new Canvas site. For those of you digging around wanting to get a, a broad perspective on, on seagrass, thinking more about um, the broader ecology, some of the, 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 I guess, the more simplistic elements of the, of the system, uh, I'd encourage you to look at our website, Project Seagrass, and um, learn, learn from there. There's a lot of educational materials, a lot of easy reading information. Uh, go for it, make the best of, of those resources. And for those struggling to um, um, remember what the hell uh, Unsworth talked about in the second year uh, when he was talking about seagrasses, um, I point you back to a, a paper that I uh, uh, suggested back then. And that's a, a quick guide to seagrass meadows, a, a very sort of um, um, a basic level a description of what the hell these, um, these plants are and, and where they live and why they're important. And it was published in Current Biology. And uh, um, when we wrote this, it was uh, um, written very constructively with a, an editorial team. Um, and they wanted the the standard of the the discussion and the, the language to be appropriate for a um, um, a fourteen year old. So it's uh, it just gives you that basic uh, uh, overview without giving you too much of a, a, a complex story. I'm also pointing to you to a um, a, a study. Um, uh, not really a study, an article, an opinion article that I also wrote um, in the journal uh, Science, and that shows how you know um, seagrass is really in trouble, and th there's a lot of um, um, change in the mindset that's required in order to uh, protect these um, through management actions around the world, and currently the. Um, the conservation focus is insufficient on uh, seagrass. So I want to kind of revisit a part of the, the story that I gave last last year in marine ecosystems, but do it in a uh, far more detailed fashion. Um, I talked about the requirements for seagrasses to, to live on this planet and I scanned over a lot of the, um, I guess, the detail really. And uh, what I hope to do now is really um, give you a, a, an idea of what are those those kind of key drivers that are enabling seagrass to proliferate or, or not in the coastal environment. What environmental conditions might seagrass require? So as you're sat here listening to this uh, uh, lecture, it would be nice if you could actually think about, you know, potentially what those uh, those requirements actually are. So I'm going to I'm going to actually sit here uh, 
for for 30 seconds and uh, allow you as the listener to think and make a couple of notes as to what you suggest might be those those needs Okay, so I hope you've managed to, to, to write a, a few things down to, to consider what uh, those environmental conditions might be. And as many of you have been um, in pretty um, um, tough environments, locked down uh, with, with COVID over the last uh, six months, I, I bet a whole number of you have um, either been involved with some form of uh, gardening activity either doing it yourself or helping a parent or a, uh, a grandma or someone on the street or so, something. Uh, there's a lot of people who've kind of become far more green fingered in the last uh, six months than they ever would. And from that, you, you, you realize, you know, the, the basic functions of a, a plant and what it needs. And seagrass is just a plant. It's just a, uh, a green um, chlorophyll dominated physio, uh, photo uh, synthesizing organism um, that needs those same broad things that your your tomato plants need um, it's all a, a case of balance so if you you overfeed your tomato plants they they go mangy and green uh, and yellow uh, if you don't give them enough nutrients or enough water they also die back they struggle um, if the uh, um, you leave them in an exposed spot um, and the wind keeps howling into them and knocking them over, then th th they lose some of their soil and uh, um, they're unable to um, survive. There's no real difference with uh, um, seagrasses. If you put um, some tomato plants in the cupboard, they're not gonna do very well. They need lots of light. Um, you know, they're, they're plants. They need those, those basic um, um, elements of life so as photosynthetic organisms they need between 5 and 20 percent of surface irradiance so surface irradiance um, is the you know the percentage of the amount of light that's coming through the uh, the air and reaching the uh, sea surface and uh, um, between 5 and 20 percent of that reaching the um, uh, the seabed where the the actual seagrasses are growing so those figures come across a range of different species from um, the temperate to the to the tropic environments. But um, we know it's in that range and it varies with respect to different species. So with increasing um, um, depth, um, light gets um, attenuated and in more turbid environments uh, light is attenuated very very um, quickly and there's something called a, a light attenuation uh, coefficient which describes how much uh, light is being um, attenuated and the uh, picture on the the right hand side top right there you can see a really muddy turbid environment um, all the light will be attenuated very very rapidly so you'll have a very high um, attenuation coefficient Whereas uh, the uh, bottom right picture, that's Lizard Island off of the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, people describe uh, diving on the uh, reefs off there as almost being sort of sort of religious experience where they're looking down to this, this sort of almost abyss of depth with um, completely clear, crystal clear waters. Um, and um, there um, you have a very, very low small light attenuation coefficient because the water is incredibly um, clear and it's not being attenuated. So we know that with increasing uh, light attenuation coefficient, um, the colonization depth of seagrasses 
that becomes a lot lot shallower and you can see that in the the figure on the the left generally seagrasses are living in that 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 top sort of um, um zero to um 10 meters uh, range really um and their, their abundance decreases after that um you do get areas um i guess um nicole esteban she's done a lot of work on the shagos archipelago and she's been finding seagrass meadows at sort of 30 35 perhaps um five meters deep perhaps deeper than that um and they're they're quite abundant um but generally um uh, in the coastal environment um the water isn't that clear and uh, seagrasses can't survive uh, at depth some information that was uh, um, published in a, a review paper by Paul Erftemeyer and Robin Lewis back in uh, 2006 in Marine Pollution Bulletin. They, they reviewed the, the light requirements of different species. And what you can see here from this, this figure um, is that across the species, that, that amount of surface irradiance that's um, and getting to the seabed um, um, describes quite the, the separation quite clearly between light requirements of different species. So something like Zostra nulti on the far left um, quite happily lives in quite turbid water in a place like uh, Planethly, um, just down the road. Um, it doesn't need much light uh, to photosynthesize. It probably photosynthesizes more likely when it's exposed at low tide. Then you've got the um, um, Posidonia. Um, if any of you have been to the Mediterranean, you've seen the, the really high light, clear, water environments that Posidonia lives in. So typically it's, it's very adapted to a high light environment. And you've got a, a gradient there um, of different species over um, different um, light requirements. But seagrasses are pretty robust um, plants. They've kind of got quite adaptive um, photophysiological mechanisms and quite adapted storage mechanisms that allow them to deal with long periods of, of stress. So um, typically in parts of the, the tropics as well as the temperate environments, you're gonna get periods of the year when um, there's a lot of uh, uh, rainfall, there's a lot of coastal flooding, that brings with it turbid water, and uh, seagrasses are gonna be stressed, sometimes having no light availability for, for weeks on end. And what we know is that so long as the, the conditions actually uh, recover to, to normal uh, after a period and they're, they're, they're enabled to, to revitalize and you know, store um, uh, food again, then they're able to deal with, with long periods of stress. And this table also from that, that same paper by Paul Eftemeyer and, and Robin uh, Lewis actually shows um, some of those periods of time that uh, seagrasses have, have been uh, stressed at and uh, the fact that they they can uh, sometimes re um, uh, survive throughout those uh, those long periods. So what's driving this uh, this uh, uh, attenuation of light? It's typically uh, uh, suspended sediments. So um, here's an image on the on the right. Uh, after one of the um, the big floods on uh, the Great Barrier Reef, and you can see how there's like a plume of sediments just travelling right down that uh, that um, um, coastal uh, fringe, and those those sediments are typically coming from uh, um, up the catchment. That's um, um, I guess riverbanks eroding, floodwaters bringing eroding soil off of the land, and that becomes sed. Uh, um, suspended in the water column and it's brought down to the coast and eventually it's going to be dumped on something and um, what that causes is a, a degradation of um, light availability because it's it's filtered out and uh, what that means is that um, not only are the the seagrass is struggling to survive but there's also some of their their ecosystem properties um, become uh, impacted too. So if a, a seagrass, you know, it might be able to survive four months with, with, with low light. 
Uh, but it's and it's in order to do that, it's burning up its uh, carbon stores that are, are in its rhizomes. And um, but at the same time, it's it's not photosynthesizing anywhere near as rapidly. And with that, it's not producing so much oxygen. And we know, and we've, I think we, we discussed it in the, the lecture in the second year, that um, oxygen is the byproduct of um, photosynthesis. And because they're so, so productive in their, uh, their photosynthetic rates that they don't just bubble that oxygen out of their leaves, but they're bubbling it out of their, um, their roots and rhizomes. So that has a huge beneficial impact upon muddy sediments that uh, can often be anoxide, stinking, sulfide rich, uh, places um, and that oxygen is, is pushed out but when they're um, they're struggling they're not so healthy uh, because of uh, high turbidity then that that um, oxygen that's been pumped out into the sediments is not as abundant and with it um, the health of those sediments um, uh, reduces it becomes a far more stressful place for those seagrasses to live and far, far more stressful for um, animals to be present in Seagrasses also need nutrients. So they need uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and a whole series of other micronutrients, just like all other plants. And like all other plants, this is a, a, a fine balance. Um, if, you, if you give your seagrasses too many nutrients, you'll put the system out of balance. And it's just like growing anything in, in your greenhouse. So what happens is you, you go from a, a scenario where there's no nutrients and seagrasses really do struggle to, to survive. And places such as the Great Barrier Reef, you get to little sand islands where you get no, no seagrasses around those islands. They're far offshore. Um, very uh, oligotrophic but then onto that little island you get a tree and uh, with that tree you then get birds and uh, the birds excreting onto that island results in nutrients um, stimulating the uh, the germination of seagrass seeds and very rapidly you get to an environment where you've suddenly got uh, seagrass and this is something that's been observed in different parts of the world where people have bought a, a lovely little exotic uh, sand, sand K island. And uh, um, they love all these clear beaches uh, with really white sand. Then suddenly they start spraying all sorts of fertilizers onto the, onto the beaches, onto the um, um, areas to play golf or to create a nice lawn. And it results in elevated levels of nutrients in the water. The seagrasses go ban bananas, and suddenly you've got detritus and uh, seagrasses are clouding up there. Not clouding up, but basically changing the coloration and the the look of what was a very clear, clear white sand beach. But very quickly, those those balances tip the other way. Too much nutrients, too many nutrients can, can cause problems. And that's because you can get um, growth of algae in the water column and uh, that in itself reduces the light available for the seagrasses to, to photosynthesize. You can also get a lot of microalgae growing all over that seagrass because you've got this huge and vast surface area for these microalgae to, to grow on and uh, the excess nutrients around, they'll very rapidly proliferate and uh, suffocate the, the seagrass, just as in that picture on the right. So you can see that the uh, uh, seagrass meadow starts to become uh, greener and greener, and that uh, reduces the light available for the seagrass to photosynthesize. But this is also a, um, a balance between the, the animal life that's present. If you've got a lot of epiplites growing on the seagrass, but at the same time you've got a a lot of grazers that are removing it, then maybe the seagrass will actually uh, uh, do very well because it's growing rapidly because it's got the nutrients, but um, those grazers are keeping the uh, epiphytes down. And uh, typically that's what we're seeing um, with small uh, crustaceans um, grazing on the, on the seagrass. 
but also in terms of um, larger grazers such as um, turtles and dugongs uh, ripping up the seagrass, uh, grazing um, the, the the plant tissue that, that's covered in um, in epiphytes and stimulating more rapid growth of fresh clean tissue which actually um, prevents the the epiphytes growing because it's so rapidly uh, growing itself and uh, we see some of that evidence when we uh, we look at um, bites of uh, um, rates of, of seagrass in tropical uh, seagrass systems by by parrotfish and you can see where you're getting higher levels of, of grazing um, you're getting reduced levels of um, microphytic epiphytic algae uh, growing on the on the seagrass and uh, what we're seeing with with uh, green turtles is that there's very strong evidence that where nutrients are, are high and there's and there's turtles uh, turtles cropping that seagrass stimulating um, growth then that that seagrass can survive to a higher degree um, when you've got uh, turtles at it rather than um, not Seagrasses also need shelter. So typically uh, you don't see seagrasses um, in the same places that, that you're going to go surfing. Uh, big waves don't do seagrasses any good. It's very difficult for seagrasses to, to get a hold in a, an area where you've got very high uh, wave action. So typically seagrasses are hiding in the lagoons in the low energy environment and uh, um, the, uh, the waves um, um, and not a good place for, for seagrasses to settle. Seagrasses actually have a, a really um, important interaction with um, uh, the shelter that exists within the, the coastal environment because seagrasses themselves, although they can't live at such high wave action as uh, surf spots, they do actually um, um, baffle some of the, uh, the energy of uh, wave action and that's because they they slow the uh, the water movement basically the more seagrass you have the more drag you create on water moving across a, um, a seabed and uh, that can cause the uh, the energy of um, um, that uh, wave action or that, that that current to be dissipated and spread out um, throughout a bay rather than hitting um, specifically one um, particular section of that bay and uh, with that as the uh, the, the sea rest causes the, the the water to slow it baffles the energy um, more and more particles uh, will actually fall out of the, the water column because the, the water is moving slower and uh, this results in an improved um, um, a light environment and this concept is what we call a, a positive feedback so the more sea rest you get the more healthy it's growing the more that slowing water column the more it's uh, uh, reducing wave energy allowing more seagrass to grow and with it improving the light environment which is in itself um, improving the conditions for seagrass to grow and photosynthesize so more seagrass goes and you're in, you're in a state of uh, positive feedback within that system obviously seagrasses need uh, a supply of carbon dioxide they produce oxygen they use carbon dioxide as a substrate for photosynthesis. What we, uh, we find is that uh, seagrasses um, very rapidly consume what we refer to as aqueous CO2. So um, they, they, uh, that's um, carbon dioxide dissolved into the, um, um, the water column, but that hasn't disassociated at that point. So if you're a seagrass, um, you want to, to utilize as much of that uh, CO2 in an aqueous fashion um, because it's very difficult, very easy to, to, to get at. Um, and um, that's, your, that's your ideal um, substrate. But relative to um, millions of years ago, aqueous CO2 in the water column is actually quite low. Um, even though it's at concerning levels because of ocean acidification, um, relative to millions of years ago, it's actually quite, uh, quite low. And seagrasses evolved when aqueous CO2 was very high in the, uh, the water column. Once CO2 is used up, 
it will use um, bicarbonate ions, HCO3 minus. And uh, what, we, what we know is that it's more energetically costly to use uh, bicarbonate than uh, CO2. So um, if you don't have so much CO2, that can be problematic in terms of, um, I guess, the, um, the growth and the development of, of seagrass. Seagrass is also living a, a, a fine balance between um, um, oxygenated um, sediments. Um, there's some indication that, that seeds are actually, that their germination is stimulated by um, anoxic sulfide environments, but they really struggle to, to live in that environment for any uh, long duration. An interesting um, feedback that's been uh, investigated within seagrass is um, is the, the idea that uh, lucinid bivalves um, have some sort of three-way symbiotic action with, um, with seagrasses and sulfide-reducing bacteria. So by having um, the bacteria in their, in their gills, um, <clears throat> they're enabling sulfide to be reduced and, um, uh, and the seagrasses themselves are uh, improving the the sulfide conditions by the oxygen that they push out from the sediments and together uh, they have a sort of a positive feedback mechanism on the um, and the oxygen conditions in the sediments and the more those seagrasses and uh, bivalves are successful the more they're able to to do that and reduce the uh, the sulfide levels making the environment more affable for those uh, species so seagrasses um, by their very nature, they are um, adapted to live in a, a saline environment. They can't, although they can be subjected to short periods of, of fresh water, they can't uh, conduct their full life cycle within it, fresh water. And uh, uh, what you see is that some species are, are more adapted to uh, lower and high, higher salinities than, than other Here's some, some work from the Florida Keys that, that really shows that um, as you, um, you change the salinity, um, species such as Syringodium are far happier in terms of their growth rates in a, um, a mid-salinity um, uh, environment, um, whereas something like Thalassia does uh, very well across all of them, and uh, Haladjali um, does best again in that mid-salinity. Mid so you get this kind of differential adaptation to those different um, salinity environments. Although seagrasses aren't subjected to the, um, the real problems of uh, bleaching that, that corals uh, actually suffer from, they are um, living within a, a careful and delicate uh, temperature um, balance. So work on the on the great Barrier reef has really shown that um, once you you push the the temperature of the the seawater above 40 degrees then you uh, cause a reduction in the photosynthetic yield um, of that of that species and some some species of seagrasses some of the the smaller um, halophilas they actually um, reduce their uh, their photosynthetic rate way before 40 degrees um, but by 45 most of the species on the Great Barrier Reef are really really struggling and uh, we see empirical evidence of that by uh, observing the, the blackening or the, the, the sort of heat stressed uh, state of, of seagrasses often referred to seagrass burning um, um, in many places um, throughout Southeast Asia um, Australasia and um, uh, the Caribbean and uh, that's because when, when you're in a, a shallow environment like a seagrass meadow uh, these these places can be subject to what we refer to as superheating so if you've got a, uh, a very shallow tide in the uh, the middle of the day and the, the weather is very very clear and hot um, high sun then you're in a, a scenario where that, that shallow water is going to rapidly um, heat up and especially if that water has low um, exchange, uh, then the potential for, for 
so actually you wouldn't expect high temperatures uh, would actually be subjected to those those high temperatures and here's a, a research example really that that uh, i guess illustrates some of these these points about the environmental conditions required for for seagrass growth some work that i did a long time ago in in Karumba in in northeast australia um, up here and uh, at this site we we investigated the the changing long-term nature of the uh the seagrasses in that area looking at the biomass of the seagrass and the uh, seagrass area and what we were finding was that um, over time the the biomass particularly was declining and there was concern amongst the regulators as to, to why this was but at the time we couldn't really work this out and it didn't become clear um, for another decade of, of monitoring and that's because <clears throat> then we began to understand that um, actually those those sea rashes there were were very nutrient limited and that's because there's there's not much around in those parts of australia the the soils are very poor there's not much agriculture there's very very few, few humans and therefore and there's not much rainfall bringing stuff down the uh, uh, the catchments so only in years of floods when there was a lot of uh, nutrients brought down the catchments did the seagrass do very well um, and it was in the years where we had extreme high temperatures and droughts that the seagrasses did very poorly so it's about this kind of water nutrient temperature um, balance that is key to um, examining the uh, understanding the uh, the growth and the productivity of seagrass over a long term and we used these models to examine um, um, I guess what might happen into the future by basically hypothesizing and extrapolating that that, that data um, and what we found is that um, with uh, um, with increasing temperature uh, with increasing river flow um, that's um, hypothesized and projected for the region then um, seagrass in the long term in that area might actually be in, in trouble throughout the Great Barrier Reef we're beginning to see a lot of this uh, this burning burning uh, problem I still work with colleagues out there they describe that every every few years we get large areas of, of seagrass burning not as dr drastic and uh, alarming as the uh, coral bleaching but it still exists it's still problematic and over time it's expected that this this will get worse importantly when we think about uh, temperature um, for a plant and its photosynthesis we need to think about the whole plant itself and if you if you raise the temperature of an organism uh, its respiration rate will increase so if we uh, increase the uh, um, the temperature of uh, um, my office now my respiration rate would uh, would go up and seagrasses are no different so and and if my respiration rate is at a higher level for an extended amount of time I will need more food um, and more energy to keep that going seagrasses um, are just the same so if you've got a higher temperature then you're going to need a higher light environment to ensure that the the seagrass can continue to photosynthesize and uh, produce uh, reams of energy and uh, various experiments that have looked at the, the interactions there have shown that um, as you get um, um, higher temperatures uh, the seagrasses tend to need a higher uh, level of light so if you're, your your uh, seagrasses are subject to um, already poor light environments poor water quality then as temperatures increase um, those seagrasses are going to become more and more vulnerable to those uh, um, uh, poor water, water quality conditions so basically in short um, to help seagrasses survive into the future in a changing climate we need to ensure that um, we improve uh, coastal water quality I guess in conclusion seagrasses are highly susceptible to change on the right of this image um, is a seagrass meadow that over a, a short period of uh, five to ten years degraded um, as a result of poor water quality and uh, it went from that to the incredibly biodiverse um, structure to a monospecific um, 
um, location struggling with low density. And finishing off this lecture, what I expect you to know, I expect you to have a broad understanding of the environmental requirements for tropical seagrass and its implications for management. I want to see you developing a detailed knowledge of experimental evidence for how light, temperature and nutrients influence tropical seagrass. And I want you to develop an understanding of the concept of positive and negative feedbacks on seagrass ecosystems and uh, their resilience. And here's a couple of papers that I point you to uh, read, particularly this one about ecological feedbacks. OK, thank you. And I look forward to discussing some of these issues in um, some of my um, um, webinar discussion um, workshops. Thank you.